So for this video, we'll be talking about the principles of regressions, what are the concepts that we need to know about uh, regression, and then we'll talk about the different assumptions that need to be satisfied for us to be able to perform regressions. And then we will be um, talking about, and I will be demonstrating to you how to perform linear regression using Jamovi, and then later on, how to present our results using tabular and textual form, uh, that is adherent to APA standards. So, many of the contents in this lecture is based on the work of Dr. Wanzer, who has a very good wide range of uh, statistical educational content and Jamovi content. So, first, let's define what regression is. So, regression is a statistical technique which can be used for modeling and analyzing numerical data. And we can make use of different uh, forms and types or scales of measure. We can use this for continuous variables and categorical variables. And then, unlike some of the bivariate statistical tests that we covered uh, in prior lectures, like for example, Spearman, Pearson, T-Test, and ANOVA, uh, regression is able to reveal predictive relationship and not just simple correlation. Predictive relationship between two or more variables. Predictive means is that once we get the uh, quantitative insights from a regression, um, we are already able to predict the level of the dependent variable when we have a particular value for the independent variable and this is something or this is an insight that we don't usually get when we do the bivariate tests that we used earlier and then of course using appropriate uh, research designs regressions can also be used to model causal relationships but of course again i am specifying that it needs to be um, aligned with an appropriate design, like a prospective design. And there are a lot of statistical controls that are being done for us to be able to say that, yeah, a particular relationship that has been generation, generated using a regression test is really indicative of a causal relationship. But if we are doing a cross-sectional study, like for example, in the survey that we are doing, um, we it's hard to say that what we're seeing as a relationship is a causal relationship. But we can infer that it's predictive. Predictive meaning, again, I would like to reiterate that predictive means that if we, um, the insights can already tell us um, what the dependent vari variable will look like or the value of the dependent variable once we know the, vari the value of the, the independent variable. So what are the advantages of regression over tests like Pearson R or Spearman Rho. So we have explained earlier, you know, it is able to have some form of predictive power or that we can gain that particular insight from a regression test. Another would be is the ability to quantify the variable influence, so which is also very much related to the predictive power. For example, in Pearson R and in Spearman Rho, we can only infer the direction and the magnitude of the relationship how strong is that relationship and what is the direction of that relationship whether that's positive or negative but in regression aside from being able to know the strength and the magnitude of the relationship we can actually quantify how much an independent variable will be moving when we are giving a de uh, given a dependent variable so uh, an outcome variable how do we expect it to move when we have a particular predictor value. Another very important difference and a good insight that you can get from regression that you cannot get from the other correlational tests that we discussed before is the ability to, to be able to control for confounding factors. So when you say confounders, these are constructs or variables that uh, that have an effect on the outcome variable but are not necessarily our interest in a particular statistical test or research question. Like for example, we want to be able to know whether or not a, um, a particular adherence to a diet will cause weight loss. But we do know that weight loss 
may be able to be may be affected by or influenced by other um, confounding factors like age, the sex of the person, the height of the person, uh, the starting BMI or the body mass index of the person, and so when in regression you'll be you can be able to see that unlike for correlational tests you are only able to see the relationship of two things but not really controlling for the effects of other confounding variables and also uh, regression you'll be able to handle multiple independent variables unlike correlational tests wherein you can only have two bivariate pairs at the time so in this one you can run a particular um, model and that model can have one outcome variable but multiple predictors or multiple independent variables so what is a linear regression so there are linear regressions and there are non-linear regressions like logistic regressions um, but for this for our class now we'll focus more on linear regression and maybe in your other future classes you'll be able to learn about logistic regression but particularly for linear regression this is something that we use to explore the relationship between a continuous dependent variable and one or more continuous and or categorical explanatory values variables so it means that uh, for linear regression we're looking at an a dependent variable or an outcome variable that is continuous all right so either ratio or interval just like the scalar variables that we are using in a particular survey and then we also have um, other types of regression based on the nature of the dependent variable or the outcome variable that we're examining like for example if your if your dependent variable is binomial or dichotomous like for example with depression or no depression right or when you say um high or low or pass not pass right so that is we're going to use a binomial logistic regression if the outcome variable is categorical and there are ranks so we use ordinal regression and then if this is a multinomial outcome variable then we use multinomial regression so we will not be able to cover logistic ordinal and multinomial regression in our class no but you know just so you know that there are different types of regression not only just linear regression which we will be doing for our class another way that you can categorize regression is through this typology so the first one is a simple linear regression so a simple linear regression is only when you have one single iv and one single dv all right and it can be equivalent and then the insights that you will get will be equivalent to a t-test one way or ANOVA correlation and it's based on the nature of the iv remember that for linear regression the dependent variable is continuous but the independent variable can be any type of variable right so yeah but what we will be really covering today is a multiple linear regression wherein we have multiple predictors in a single dependent variable so like i said no, this is one of the advantages that you have over correlational tests like pearson and spearman is that this one you can have more than one iv placed in a model placed in a test compared to a uh a correlation test where you only have one IV and one DV. Another type of regression is called hierarchical regression wherein the multiple predictors are there still and then there are single there's a single outcome or single dependent variable but the predictors are added as steps one by one not as a whole no or blocks to gain insights on the extent to which how much of the variance is added or explained as you put more variables into the model so a simple like entry multiple regression we just put all the variables in one go and then we really don't look at the insights as we add them but if our plan is to look at the insights as we add each of the independent variable into the model then that's hierarchical regression now when do i use a simple enter multiple regression or a hierarchical regression again it's based on your theoretical foundations on the research that you're doing you know 
So, but we will just do the enter type. When we say enter, this is just we just put all of the of the independent variables at once. We don't really kind of investigate how much of the insights or the variables or the values are changing as we put each independent variable in. So you may have already heard me say these words, but I will be, um, I, I might be speaking of dependent variable as another type or another name, or it can be also named as an outcome variable, but that's the same, it's also still outcome variable. Very rarely do I use response variable, but I interchange the words dependent variable and outcome variable, right? And then independent variable, in a regression, we can call them also as predictors or explanatory variables. Explanatory, especially when you're using a logistic model. So I might be using independent or predictor variable interchangeably. And this is an example of a uh, basic you know, regression equation. But uh, there is a, in the next slide, we'll talk about really what are the different parts of a regression equation. So in the regression equation, your y is your dependent variable or outcome variable of interest. And your x is your independent variable or predictor. Again, you can have multiple x's, you have multiple predictors. And then, of course, there is a coefficient and that coefficient is the slope. How is, is the slope positive? Is the slope negative? Right? Again, it, it is very similar to the correlation but here the slope or the coefficient tells you exactly what is the how much is added into the dependent variable for every time that x adds one value or one unit right? and then we have a constant or an intercept and the constant or intercept is the value of y or the value of the dependent variable when everything else is zero so when er when all of the predictors are zero what is the value of y so that's their intercept but usually you know in uh, in the way we appreciate them you know, the intercept is just there we we know what it is but we rarely report what the intercept is in the textual data or sometimes even in the tabular data so when you visualize a linear regression, it's very much, you know, how you see it you know, in the um, in a correlation. But again, like I said, you can now have a, um, you can have more insights. You know? So for example, um, we want to see if there is, if the age of the person, you know, increases the rate of being able to own a cat. Right? So, this is the number of cats owned by, and this is, that's for the y-axis, and then for the x-axis is the age. So, where the predictor is age, the outcome is cat ownership or the number of cats that you own. And the red ones, the red dots, are the individual data points for each, um, each uh, respondent. And then the line is basically where, you know, uh it's plotted based on which one has you know, the equal distance from each of the data set right? and then so you have your y so that's your outcome variable right and then your 0 0.2934 no, this one i think they interchange it but this one is your intercept meaning if age is zero then the number of cats that you own is in the factor of 0 0.2934 and then here is um, your x is your age so for every 0 0.0629 increase ah uh, for every increase sorry i'm uh for every increase in age there is a 0 0.0629 increase in cats on of course you know these are just numbers that we're looking at but you would see this is basically the rate of increase of number of cats as you age Right. So again, this is a predictor. And then the R squared is very important because the R squared tells you the extent to which uh, or the, the extent of variance that the certain model that you've created um, 
can explain. So, uh, the R squared, you usually get the, you, you multiply it with 100. So, it means that there's 80, this model, no, explains 84.62% of the variance of cat ownership. I highly doubt that that's the case. This is a very hypothetical um, this is a very hypothetical example, no? but it means that there's an 84.62% um, uh, that this model explains 84.62% of the variance of cat ownership. So, what are the different assumptions that we have to uh, kind of have before we are able to perform a linear regression? Uh, so, the first one is um, you know, having a small number of outliers or, you know, removing all of the outliers. Uh, why do we have to do that? Because outliers can exert a strong influence on the regression line by pulling it closer or pushing it away from the majority of data points. And this can result in a misleading representation of the relationship between the variables. The regression line may be overly influenced by the outlier, leading to an inaccurate estimation of the true underlying relationship. It can have an impact on the slope and the intercept, and it can also have an impact on the other assumptions that are enumerated in this slide. The second one is normality. Right? So normality, you know, we have explained this before. It's very important because it has something to do with the validity of statistical tests that we're doing in general. Um, normality assumption is also crucial for constructing accurate confidence intervals for regression coefficients. Um, it is also very important to make sure that the model has a good fit. Uh, and, you know, it also ensures that um, the results are robust. But, you know, it is also worth noting that the normality assumption primarily pertains to residuals and not necessarily the distribution of independent and dependent variables. While we want normality. Uh, linear regression is also known to be fairly robust in itself. So it can have some, it can take some departures from normality, especially when our sample size is large. You know? So again, we'll talk about sample size computations later and how we can kind of look away sometimes from these assumptions. But again, these are the ideal ones. This, you know, especially when you have a very small sample size, normality is very much important. Next is that the independent and the dependent variables that we have to be looking at is theoretically having a linear relationship. Meaning, you know, if one moves up, the other moves up as well or down. But there are times wherein you have two variables, but theoretically their relationship is not really linear. So let's give an example. So if the independent variable is your age and your dependent variable is like, let's say, how many times do you spend with siblings, right? So for this one, when you are younger, you have you know, higher levels of, you know, time spent with siblings. But as you go older, it becomes, you know, in the middle of your age, it becomes slower. You no, know, you don't see your siblings as much, especially when you have your own families. But then after you have an empty nest, you know, when you grow older, then you spend more time with your siblings again. So this is called, you know, a parabolic or a curvilinear relationship. And there's a different test that we want to kind of um, use if we want to be able to say that a certain relationship is curvilinear. So again, theoretically, is your IV and DV really expected to demonstrate a linear relationship? Because if they're not, then maybe you should be using a different regression test. The next one is homoscedasticity. And so homoscedasticity or homogeneity of variance. So what is homoscedasticity? It's the assumption of constant variance and it's important in the assumption in regression analysis. It refers to the condition where the variability of the residuals or the differences between the observed and predicted values is constant across levels of the independent variable. So that's what homoscedasticity is. So in simpler terms, homoscedasticity means that the spread of the dispersion 
or the spread or dispersion of residuals is same across the entire range of the predictor variables that were included in the model. Um, and so it ensures that our inferences are valid, that our model is reliable, and that there is an assumption of independence among the predictor variables, which is again very much related to the other linear regression assumptions here. Then we have autocorrelation, wherein if you ha if you're dealing with series or time series data, meaning you're collecting um you're collecting a certain variable, data for a certain variable in multiple periods of time, you have to make sure that they're not correlated. You know? And then of course there is a particular um particular test that we can use in order for us to check for autocorrelation. We call the Durbin Watson test. You no, know? I'll share a video that does Durbin Watson test. But um, it may not be as important when we're working with cross-sectional data as the data that we're using for our uh, for our you know sample survey forms. And then we have you know it's there should be no multicollinearity. Multicollinearity means that there should not be there should not be very high you know relationships among the independent variables. So. Um, if there is a high or high magnitude of relationships among the independent variables, then it is a violation of multicollinearity. So it may have an unreliable in estimate for the individual predictor. It can have a misleading interpretation of how important the predictor is in terms of the variance it explains, especially when you're doing hierarchical tests. And uh, it also can affect the identification of significant predictors. And the last one, and I place this in asterisk because this differs, you know, from one field of study or from one discipline to the next. You have, you know, uh, there are some disciplines wherein, you know, we, before you do a linear regression, you have to test the independent and the dependent variables um, singly first. So you have to, you know, see whether or not in terms of Pearson or Spearman, there is a relationship between independent and dependent variable, the dependent variable and each independent variable before you place them into the model. Um, and those that are not significant should not be placed in the model anymore. But this, again, this is uh, something that's variable across disciplines, no? So that's why I'm putting it in asterisk. So this is an example of a result that you can generate from Jamovi in relation to, you know, doing a multiple regression test. So um, you have here the list of predictors that you have included, you know. So you have, um, and so the bas basic question here, you know, in the work of Dr. Wanzer is, you know, does a person's... Um, does Dan's grumpiness increase or is predicted by the number of hours of sleep of Dan or Dan's baby? And so the there are multiple, uh, the sleep hours of Dan and the baby was computed over a period of time and then they were placed here, right? So these are the two predictors. You have Dan's sleep and then you have your baby sleep and then you have your estimate. So what are important things here? So of course you have to look at the p-value. So the p-value will tell you whether or not a particular um, a particular predictor predicts you know uh, your dependent variable. So in this case grumpiness. So you would see that the p-value that has less than 0 0.05 is Dan sleep and then for the baby sleep it's not significant so and then we have the value for the intercept meaning that the grumpiness score is 125.97 right um so it means that uh when the both sleep scores are zero the grumpiness score is 125.97 although this example does not explain much it's the highest level of grumpiness but that's the score and then the estimate here there are two things that we have to look at so the first thing that you look at is 
the sign. So if the sign is positive, then it's a positive relationship. If it's negative, then it's a negative relationship. But this estimate, compared to the estimate that you get for correlation, this estimate tells you that for every additional hour that Dan sleeps, there is 8.95 points lost in grumpiness. And the same thing, no? for every sleep lost, there is an 8.95 number of points for grumpiness that is added. Right? And then when everything else is zero, the grumpiness score is 125.97. And then you also have to look at the predictability no, of the whole model. So when you look at the whole model together, is the whole model predicting grumpiness? So you will have to look at the p-value here. So if it's less than 0 0.05, it means that taken together, the whole model is able to explain the variance, explain the outcome variable. And then how much of the variance or the changes in that particular variable is explained by the model, you look at R squared. And this is 0.82. So it means that 82% of grumpiness is explained by the model, including Dan and the baby's sleep. But again, between Dan and baby's sleep, an individual predictor will give you a score on. Uh, the, uh, so the uh, the individual predictor that really predicts grumpiness significantly is done sleep and not the sleep of the baby. When visualized as an uh, equation, y, which is grumpiness, is equals to the intercept minus 8.95 times how much is done sleep. And then 0 0.1, which is the estimate of baby sleep. So, for example, if Dan's sleep was just 5 and the baby sleep was 8, how, how much grumpiness do we expect Dan to, you know, have? So, y is equals to 125, the intercept, 895 times 5, five plus 0 0.01 times 8, and this is the actual score of the grumpiness of that. Again, it wasn't specified what is the maximum score of grumpiness, but I feel like that's very dumb. Right? So this is how we kind of look at um, linear regression equations. Okay, so I am now going to demonstrate how to perform a multiple linear regression analysis using Jamovi. And for this particular example, we're going to ask this research question. Thus, demographic profile, internet profile, and social media competence, predict expressive online gender advocacy All right so this is our uh, research question so you would find that that's familiar because that's our sort of extra research question that's not really part of your final paper that we articulated for our class so this is one way for us to be able to articulate a regression question there are other ways that you can do it but we'll stick to this for our particular use so, as I explained earlier, when you do multiple regression, you can have a singular outcome variable, and then you can have multiple predictors. So, particularly for this research question, our outcome variable, based on the way we frame the question, is expressive online gender advocacy. So, basically, it's operationalized as um, how cert, uh, the extent to which a person uses social media in order to advocate for anything about gender equality online. So there are a, a couple of questions that are being asked in relation to that. So that's your expressive online gender advocacy. So um, what are the independent variables? So the first set of independent variables represent demographic profile of course so we have your age we have sex sign at birth we have sex sexual orientation 
and gender identity. So there are two um two categories. You have cis heterosexuals and LGBTQ plus, and then you have income, which is uh has seven groups. Um, and then we have uh, what are the uh, we ask the students what are the social media sites that you are active on and then this and then it was answerable by yes or no and what the list of social media sites that we included were facebook ig twitter youtube and tiktok and then we also asked them the number of gadgets that they own including smartphones tablets laptops and desktop computers gaming consoles etc the higher the number, the more gadgets they own. They own, and then so that's so the first four. This is for demographic profile. This two is for internet profile, and this four is social media competence. So it's a scale that measures the extent to which you are competent in using social media. And then there are four domains based on the work of Zoo, and these are technical usability, the extent to which you know the how to use a particular social media. Um, platform. You have content interpretation, the extent to which you're able to interpret the content that you're seeing in a particular social media. And then you have content generation. It's your skills in terms of generating content. And then anticipatory reflection is your ability to be able to think before you click. You are able to anticipate how people would react when you post, before you post you know, the things that you post. So the argument here is that your demographic profile and your internet profile, because these are affordances that you have. Well, the first one is, of course, social factors that uh, can affect the extent to which you engage in gender advocacy. The next two, the, the internet profile and social media competence, these are resources that you can have, intangible resources that you can have in order to help you engage in gender advocacy. So we want to be able to see... Um, what are the different significant predictors you know, um, of uh, online expressive online gender advocacy? So where do we find that? So we go to analysis and then we click regression and then we click linear regression. And then you would see here that the independent that the dependent variable has this scale, you know, this ruler. Um, so it means that you can only put something that is a scalar or a continuous variable. So this is our, this is the uh, expressive engagement, right? So here you go. So wala pang lumalabas here. So as we place variables, you would see that there would be additional um, values that will be coming up here. So let as include all of the variables that we have put here. So we put age. And then you would see that as we go along, you would see that, you know, estimates as a standard error, T value and P value would have here. And then you have your R and your R squared. And then you have your, um, and then let's put sex assigned at birth. So, and then um, how do you choose? When do you put things in covariates and when do you put things in factors? So if it's a continuous variable, you put them in covariates. When it is a categorical variable, you put it in factors, right? So we place here factors. So, and you would see that the, the way it looks like in the predictor set is different. And I'll explain later why is that, right? And then we put income ID. So since income is an ordinal variable, uh, no, we put SOGI first. So SOGI is whether they are LGBT or not LGBT. So it's a binomial variable categorical. So let's put them in factors. One being those who are LGBT and zero being cisgenders. And then we have income, second brackets. And then since this is a categorical variable, we place them under factors. Okay. And then, so you would see as you add variables, you would see that there are, in, you know, additions, additions that are in, included here. And then we have active social media sites. So I have here Facebook. So basically they were asked yes or no. Are you on, are you active on Facebook? Are you active on Twitter, etc.? And then we use that for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And since this is a yes or no question, it's binomial. It's categorical, nominal. So let's place them in factors. 
So if it's one, it means that they are on it. Uh, it means that they are active on it. And then zero means that they are not active on that particular social media account. Right? So you would notice that the p-value changes as you put more variables. And that's the explanation I was telling earlier in the lecture part of this is that you're able to control for confounders. Now, for example, in a correlation, you won't be able to see how a certain um, relationship of an independent variable is affected by the presence of other independent variables. In this case, as you add more independent variables, it kind of interacts with that independent variable because you want to know if this particular variable will remain to be a significant correlate and the extent to which that variable has a certain um, weight in terms of correlating with the dependent variable, even with the presence of under independent variables in a particular model. So you kind of already control for the effect of the other independent variables in the model. So now we're done with that. And then we'll put number of gadgets. And since it is accounting, you count how many gadgets they have. So it's a ratio variable. So we place it under um, covariates. No? And then since the all of the SMCs, SMC domains are all scales, we put them also under covariates. And so we place them now. Um, con, uh, technical usability, content interpretation, content generation, and anticipatory reflection and put them under covariates. And now this is the model. So the first thing that you look for is you click assumption checks. No, model fit. I'm sorry. You check for model fit. By the, by the way, there are assumption checks here. Uh, some of them are um, the ones that we discussed earlier. Right. Um, these are some of the assumptions that you have to make sure so that you can do linear regression. We won't be able to have that time here, but I will send a link of another video that does this you know, so that if you're interested. OK. By the way, what is the sample size of this? I think our sample size, so just so you know how many samples we have, I'll just do a descriptive. So the sample size is 1063. So we have a large enough sample size. Naman. All right, so let's click on F-test. All right, so the F-test will tell you if the overall model has a, um, as, uh, if the overall model really significantly predicts. Ibig sabihin, when you take everything into the model, does the whole model predict the behavior of the variable of the dependent variable, which is our expressive online gender advocacy. And then, of course, the first thing that you look at in the model fit measures, you look at the p-value. And if it's less than 0 0.05, it means that the whole model explains the behavior of online, expressive online gender advocacy. Right? So that, that's the first insight that you get. And then the second insight that you get is R squared. So the R squared is the variance the percentage of the variance explained. So you multiply this with 100. And so it means that this model is able to explain 12% of the variance of online gender, expressive online gender advocacy. It means that for the variables that we have included in the independent, in the explanatory variables that we included, the predictors that we included, they're able to explain 12% of the variance. So it means that there is still around 88% um, that is not yet explained. So maybe that is the work of other variables that we haven't really considered yet. But at the moment, it's 12%. In the social sciences, if you get 10%, that's kind of already okay, right? So we have 12%. So that means that it appears like it's a, it's it's explaining enough for a social construct particularly a behavioral construct. So that's the second thing that you look at. Um, and then, um, while, of course, the intercept here shows, again, you know, it's when everything else is zero, this is the value. It means that 1.42 out of 5, because the highest score for uh, advocacy is 5. So out of 5, the score for advocacy is 1.42 when everything else is zero. So it means it's kind of low. 
no and, and we we expect that no usually advocacy behaviors are quite really low no not everyone really does expressively advocate for gender equality but what we look at here is that we want to see so the whole thing predicts the behavior or the variance of gender advocacy online but we want to find out if there are particular variables that are actually significantly predicting when you control for everything else. So the first thing that you have to look at is the p-value of the particular variable that is less than 0.05. So I'll go low first, right? Because I want to start for, for first with continuous predictors. So these are your continuous predictors. So you see here, 0.01, right? 0.01 uh, for anticipatory reflection, less than 0.01 for content generation, and 0.47 for technical usability. So it means that when controlling for everything else, meaning if everything else is kept constant, when all of the other independent variables in the models are kept constant, anticipatory reflection on its own has a significant influence on or a significant relationship or a significant predictive relationship on online gender advocacy. And then after looking at the particular p-values that are less than 0.05, the significant predictors, you want to see the direction and the increments that it is able to contribute, you know, Again, this is a predictive model. So when you have a value for a particular independent variable, you can already kind of predict the value of the in the dependent variable. So here, it's negative. So ibig sabihin here, the, the higher the anticipatory reflection, the lower the online gender advocacy. And, and some explanation that we offered here in a particular publication that we did in relation to this data is that um, since talking about gender equality can really be um, can really induce some conflicts online. So people who are anticipatory reflective about not wanting to engage in conflicts online would most likely not be very expressive about their gender um, justice uh, insights because they they wanna they anticipate that they might get into conflict in the future. That's why it's lesser here right and then content generation the better you are at generating content online the better the more you uh so this one is positive right so higher content generation higher uh gender higher gender advocacy and then weirdly technical usability the lesser the technical usability the higher the online gender advocacy so I guess it's also related to anticipatory reflection, right? So I'm just really reporting. But what these estimates also say is that for every step of anticipatory reflection, you would expect that there, for every one point additional anticipatory reflection, which is also up to five, you expect that the um, online advocacy will decrease by negative uh, by 0 0.17 points. Right, and then for every one point of con of one, one unit increase or one point increase in um in content generation, you expect that the, there is a zero point thirty eight increase in online gender advocacy when everything else is held constant or controlled, and then for every one point of technical usability, um there is a decrease in zero point twelve. How about the others that are not significant in terms of individual? So it means that the, the threshold is not that significant enough for us to say that individually, when everything else is controlled, this can have an influence. So you, you, will, you will be able to find that some of those that were correlated using T-test or, or using T-test or Spearman or Man Whitney, they were correlated when they were connected individually but once they started to be put in to be put in a model together with other independent variables or predictors you would find that they will no longer be 
significantly, individually significantly predicting a variable. It's because when you have confounders, then that relationship is not anymore that dependable or reliable. And if in the model, they still have a good p-value that's less than 0.05, it means that you know when you control everything else, this one can have a significant effect or a significant co contribution to the variance of online gender advocacy. So that is for your continuous variables. Now, you we also see that there are others here in terms of p-values that are also less than 0 0.05. But these var variables, the independent variables, are not continuous, but they're rather um, they're rather categorical. So how do we now make sense of it now? So for example, less than 0, 0, 0.01, right? And then you look at the estimate. So you would see that the categories, the categorical variables will be um will be will have a diff, uh, additional insight so they will have they will show the categories and the cate and then the other category that they are comparing so in if you have a binomial variable a dichotomous variable you only have one because you're only comparing two variable two categories so in this case lgbt non lgbt or cisgender heter heterosexuals so this is less than 0, 0, 001 so you would look at the estimate so if the estimate is positive it means the one in the right is higher if it's negative, the one on the left is higher. So it means here that we expect that people who identify as LGBTQ plus are 0 0.4 are how uh, you will expect that for LGBTQ plus, there's 0 0.445 more higher score for online gender advocacy compared to their cis heterosexual counterparts. Or if it's cis heterosexual, then it's less than 0 0.45. So that's what this means. Okay? So, and it's expected, no? You LGBTQ plus individuals are more likely to engage in online gender ad advocacy because they have lived experiences of gender inequality. And so they would more likely be engaged in things that they are that are directly affecting them to to you know to be able to protect their social identity and achieve social justice for their particular identity and then you would see here for income you have seven categories so it will be now divided into a reference value we have a reference uh, uh the different categories versus a reference value so the jamovi will set a reference category or reference value that is usually the lowest so this one means um uh low income versus poor low middle versus poor middle middle versus poor high income ver a uh, high middle versus poor high income versus poor and then um, very high income versus poor. Now, you can change that if you like. And for example, if I want my reference to be the high income, so I can change the reference levels here. And let's say, for example, for income, I say seven. So you would see here a change na ko compare yung poor versus rich, low versus rich, etc., etc. So you can change it. Now, why do you want to change it? It's based on uh, what is comfortable for you to be the reference category. So, for example, I can also change the reference level to male and magbabago siya. Or I can also change this to the reference level to one here. So, you would see here that your zero, the cisgender, you would see the negative sign here now because I changed the reference level. So, the reference level is based on what you think is more um, useful to you, I would say. Okay, so so LGBT, so LGBT, those who identify as LGBTQ+, higher, you know, uh, you see, you, you examine or you observe higher levels of online gender advocacy. Now let's move here. So we have Facebook, no, because it's not less than 0 0.05, not less than 0 0.05. And then we have Instagram, it's 0 0.023. It means that, so and then we look at the, the estimates. 
No? So first, the grouping, the reference is not using Instagram and one is those using Instagram because one is yes, zero is no. So you have a positive value. It means that the one in the left no, is higher. The one in the left is higher. So it means that those who own, those, those who are active on Instagram are 0 0.15 points higher in terms of online gender advocacy compared to the general population, the general sample. And then I can switch that the wrong. I can switch it the other way if I change the reference becoming zero. It means that those who do not have Instagram have, have 0 0.15 points lesser compared to the general sample. So that's the, or the, the mean, no, the average value of the gender online advocacy. So yan siya. Okay? So again, if it's positive, you look at the left. Sorry, I think I misspoke earlier. So if it's positive, then the left is higher. If it's negative, then the right is higher. Okay? So now, how do we report this? All right. So I have here, of course, you have the, I have the, um, this is what your going output should be. Now. So how do we represent it using APA? So you have the table number, and this is the table name. No, Multiple regression results on the predictors of expressive online gender advocacy, which is the dependent variable of interest. And we have your predictors of expressive online gender advocacy. All right. So let us um, include. So maybe, you know, so just... I'm not very, oh, sige. erase that. So let's move on. So we put the predictors here in the, in the first column. So the first column is predictors. So I would put here age, and then I would put here sex, and then I would place here under, you have female, male, okay? And sex assigned at birth. Right, and then we have then make sure that you don't just write what you find here, okay? So you have to place a sexual orientation and gender and gender identity, All right? And then we have here um, LGBTQ. Plus, and then maybe our reference would be uh, a reference, a better reference would be I would change here and I'll make the reference as cis heterosexual. Is there the more the dominant cis hetero? And then we have LGBTQ. Plus, all right. And then next is household estimated. Household income. So this one is a bit difficult because I have to do everything one by one. So I put back the reference value to the poor because that's what we usually do. Right. So we have um uh low income versus poor. You have low middle versus poor. You have middle middle versus poor and then you have high middle versus poor you have high income versus poor and then you have and then I add more and this is the reason why I don't use seven categories because it's quite cumbersome but we've did done it anyway. So we have um rich versus poor. All right. And then the next would be um and then maybe, maybe we can kind of have a 
categorization here. So we have um inter uh uh okay, let's say Facebook use Facebook use and then yes no and then I'll just copy paste and then just change the name of the okay, so Facebook use Twitter use Instagram use and then YouTube use and then we have TikTok use right and then you have number of gadgets and then you have technical usability content interpretation and then content generation and then anticipatory reflection so i you can choose not to put any more the intercept okay right and then we have for age no so we replace what you see like for example and then probably you can choose to just highlight you know two decimal points so this would be 0 0.23 or 20 uh, sorry 0 0.02 yeah s is 0 0.01 uh, sorry 0 0.02 and then you have 1.20 and then 0 0.229. And then next you have, so let's make this all like that. And then for male, female, 0 0.6, 0 0.07, 0 0.05, and then this is 1.17, and then 0 0.242. And then for this one, you have negative, 0 0.46, 0 0.07, negative 6.13, and then less than 0 0.001. And then for the estimate that is less than 0 0.05, you signify, you know, like the ones that we used in the earlier ones. So I put three asterisks here because it's less than 0, 0 0.1. So um, I'll, I'll pause it. I'll pause the recording and then I'll do everything. I'll put everything here so that we don't take so much time in this video. All right. So we have we have completed the inputs here, the values. Okay. So this is what you're probably go you're going to be doing you now for your so and then we have to make it API style. So let's remove the borders and then replace the bottom and the top borders right oh one more top right okay so there you go um maybe you're wondering what are the other because you were looking at the p value and the and the and the estimates but how about the other values now that we see in the test so for example the r is basically the slope of the regression line no so that's but we don't usually have to report it the r squared very important because again this is the variance explained f is the statistic that we use um in order for us to test for the significance but the but the interpretation of this is the p value right and the df it one and the df2 as you know is related to the degrees of freedom Right, but again, we usually just report the p value, you no, know, and the f also. That's what we report, and then you have your um, and then of course the estimates. And the se is kind of the standard error. It basically estimates how far is the estimate found here, and from the true population data. And the t values the statistics that we kind of use in order for us to be able to see whether or not a certain um indicator or a certain predictor is significant but again the interpretation is by using the p value all right so let's see um how do we now 
And then what other things do we have to include here? So notes. So you can include here um, R squared, right? R, the R squared value is very important. So R is 0 0.0.2. 0 oh, no, 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 sorry, 12. And then you also report the F, which is 7.51. Okay. So it's model fit measures. Model, model fit measures. And then we have the P is less than 0 0.001. And then, of course, you have the note. Or in if it's as p is equals to less than 0 0.05, the usual. If it's 2, then p is less than 0 0.01. And then that law, p is less than 0 0.001. There. So that's, that's the notes that you put. Okay, so let's now report. No, So table 6 shows the results of the multi multiple regression multiple linear regression test uh, to determine the significant predictors of expressive online gender advocacy the mo and then the first one we have to interpret the model first. So the model significantly predicts expressive online gender advocacy. Or we can say the model significantly ah, sorry, tama. Uh, predicts, sorry about that, predicts expressive online gender advocacy. And ex and then we have to place the value. So F equals 7.51, P less than 0 0.001, and explains, so again, the R squared is 0 0.12, so we multiply by 100 as 12.0% of its variance. Okay. And then we can explain now, we can, you know, among the uh, predictors included in the model, Among, let's say, among the independent variables included in the model, sexual orientation and gender identity. What else? Instagram use. What else? I'll make this na lang a small, anyway, no. Uh, what else? We have technical usability. Technical usability. Content generation. And anticipatory reflection. Significantly predicted online expressive online gender advocacy expressive online gender advocacy right so um for every predictor that you have selected you will place the estimate so b is equals to negative 0.46 and then the t-value 0 equals negative 6.13. And then the p-value p less than 0 0.001. So let's do the same for Instagram news. Uh, it's 0, um, b, or the 
estimate no, the coefficient 0 0.16. T is equals to 0 0.08. And P is less than 0 0.03. Technical usability um, is um, negative B is equals to negative 0 0.13. Oh, ba? Yeah. And then the um, P is equals to 0 0.97. P is, is equals to, sorry, this one should be equal, is equals to 0 0.47, 0 0.047, and then comma, for content generation, it's P is equals to 0 0.39. And then the P is negative 1.99. And then P is less than 0 0.01. And then for anticipatory reflection, you also place the results. B is equals to negative 0 0.18. Comma T is equals to negative 0 0.68. P equals to 0 0.02. Significantly predictive expressive online gender. Significantly predicted online gender advocacy. And then the last statement should be the directions to specify how do these particular significant predictors actually predict online gender advocacy. Findings suggest that respondents or in your case students no let's say these are students no? student respondents who identify so because the first question is sexual okay so which which identif which predicts higher online expressive uh, expressive online gender adv advocacy so these those are the lgbtq plus identify as LGBTQ plus active on Instagram, right? Because that's what we saw. Positive for Instagram, right? Yeah. And then we have and then uh, lower technical with lower technical usability Higher content generation and anticipate and lower anticipatory reflection scores were observed to have higher expressive higher scores on expressive online gender advocacy. So that's one way of writing it. Or another way is um, finding suggests that student respondents who identify as LGBTQ active on Instagram with lower technical usability, higher content generation, and lower anticipatory reflection scores demonstrated higher expressive online gender advocacy so those are ways that you can write it so this is the full report you have the text here explaining what's happening in the table okay just make sure that the table is not cut so i'll put it in the next page because the table is quite tall okay so i hope that you're able to follow this and apply this on your particular data sets